Hey folks, this is Waylon Lewis of ElephantJournal.com. We do a lot of interviews with like politicians and spiritual people and yogis and environmentalists and weirdos and activists and all over the map. But I also run a writing school called Elephant Academy and we host thousands of writers on Elephant Journal as our mission is to share people's stories and their voices and all that good stuff to be a benefit to our world. And we have a writer who has been writing on Elephant, who is amazing, incredibly powerful, unique, and yet accessible voice. I wanted to talk about being a writer in 2023 because it's super confusing. Basically, Facebook and all of social media became sort of anti-anyone, like starting a business, sharing stuff, being a writer, all that about seven years ago, the landscape shifted. So how the heck do you write in an accessible way that isn't clickbaity? I'm coming at you live from my house here in Tulsa. Got a little artwork behind me here. Got a little little, uh, little remembrance of New York City and a little bit of LA, both cities I've lived in. Yeah, you uh, wrote about leaving New York. That was the, yeah, the, new, the New York we'll, we'll get into, lots right. to talk about. Right. So uh, happy to meet you. So you have an article that I think I don't even ever have to Google is on Elephant, yeah. um, titled uh, something about your soulmate isn't who you think it is. Uh, yes, yes, er, my, my very first Elephant Journal post many moons yeah, ago. Yeah, and I think that started on Good Men Project. We had a partnership Correct. with them at the time and we're yeah. still partnering and friends with them. Indeed. All these years later. But um, I never even have to Google it because it's always just like I type it into the bar and it pops up because is never far away from something we're always sharing and resharing, oh, not great. just because it does well, which it does, but because it's a great message. Thank you. So um, that is to say, and I looked at the date of that article. Yeah. And it's like 2012. A few weeks ago. A little, yeah. a little, a little while ago. So, and then recently, I feel like you came back to Elephant and been writing up a storm again. And True. I was reading an article, I think, about you leaving New York. That's the latest one, yes. How I got everything I ever wanted by walking away from everything I ever wanted. Yeah. So wait, say that one more time. It was fading out for some reason. How I got everything I ever wanted by walking away from everything I ever wanted. So that's the first thing I want to talk to you about. Yeah. I already introed that I want to talk to you about being a writer and uh, you know, how to be a writer in 2023. And this is one of the things I love about you. I feel like Michael Pollan, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, um, Elizabeth Gilbert, there's like Margaret Rankle is a recent one who I love. But you have this voice, like those folks who I just mentioned. Everyone has very different voices. My point isn't you have the same kind of voice. My point is your voice is incredibly powerful, number one but also accessible. So how the heck do you do that? That combination of like, it cuts through all the noise, but it's also weirdly simple. Like those titles are get through, but they're simple. Yeah, yeah. well, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a few things that I've picked up along the way. One is uh, I've been working in advertising for 20 years. Um, that's sort of my day job in writing. So our job is the kind of, what can you do in five to 10 words? It's really gonna stop people from you know, when I got started, it was all about magazine ads and television spots. And your job as someone flipping through the newspaper or the sorry, the magazine is how do you get them to stop? Oh, what was that? That was interesting. And, you know, if you can do that with a headline, you've really you've really done something. But how? Um, I feel like advertising. I know a ton of successful advertising types in Boulder, Colorado. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very popular ad town. Yeah. And they're good at what they do. But at the same time, often advertising messages are off-putting, you know? Sure. We're so trained as like citizens of, of capitalism to right. kind of like want to resist some of that crap. Your sure. articles don't feel, I would never accuse them of clickbait. Yeah. And that is actually quite a yeah. compliment because they're very simple and they grab the heck out yeah. of you. They grab your collar. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I try to, um, I, I took the advice of like, don't try to write to thousands, try to write to one person and maybe Try to write to a younger version of yourself. Um, so it's funny, I've got a new article that I'm working on right now titled, Why Your Next Relationship Might Not Work Out Either. And it's not, it's, it's not a lecture to other people. It's a lecture to a younger version of myself. 
Because uh, I didn't take off, you know, it's, a, it's about kind of, did you take enough time off in between that last one before you threw yourself headlong into another one? But I, I find if I could just spend the rest of my life giving advice to my former self, I think I'll have enough material to just fill a whole lot of articles and books. Yeah, because so this is a high compliment and it's not flattery and I'll, I'll make it clear why it's not is, you know, I'm a successful writer. I have a couple books. I have a website, Elephant. I write, you know, a million articles, some of which do really well. Yeah. And and yet I struggle so yeah. hard with like titles. Like I just did this interview with this lady. It, it wasn't an article that I wrote, but it was an interview with this lady. I do interviews like with yourself, like all yeah. the time. And then I go to title them and I'm like, mm -hmm. Waylon talks with Angie Cho about feng shui. And you're like, no one wants to read that. But yeah the interest I had, which is where I try to title it, like what's mm -hmm. the core interest right. is, you know, in feng shui and how it can like revolutionize your understanding of space in your home. And, but using that as an example, which is a little unfair to you because you're not inside of the article or the conversation, yeah. but how do you t title something when like the literal title is so boring, but the dis the, the heart of your interest is really interesting. Yeah, I think, I mean, I often start with the title, uh, which sounds I yeah. mean, only, be, only because I, I have to start with a premise. Right. Um, like what, what's the, and I, and I think it's, it's not gonna be terribly interesting unless it's a, a little bit um, contrarian to what the rest of the world is thinking. That's um, a lot of your titles have that. There's like a yeah. tension yeah. when I teach titling yeah. I mean, I teach it and I still feel in case anyone out there thinks anyone has it figured out, like yeah. I teach this stuff and I feel like I suck at it. There's a tension or a contradiction inherent yeah. in the premise. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, what what's going to, you know, uh, we're not going to be really drawn to something that already tells us something we already know. We're sort of drawn by like, oh, that seems different. How, how's it, how, how are they going to support that point of view? And like, oh, wait, how? How do they, how are they advancing this argument? Yeah. Um, then you've kind of, you've got, you've got to get at that tension. And I, I think, you know, advertising teaches you to do that a lot. What is this sort of disruptive thought that's, that's, that's an original thought that doesn't remind us of something we've heard a million times before. Um, you know, even, even one of my other recent articles, uh, the, the real reason why men date younger women, which has gotten a little, little controversy, but uh, a lot of, a lot of views. Uh, as I, I hear, I hear a lot of theories about what what men are looking for, and from what I've seen myself and other men, uh, it's for another reason, and, and not an innocent one. It's a, it's an article that's squarely criti critical of, of male egos. I mean, the uh, but it, I, I, I wouldn't have written article, it. The delight Sorry. in that article, the title presents something yeah. obviously very almost like Bravo reality, yeah. like scandalous. You want to read it; it grips yeah. you. But then you read it, and your your voice and your where you're coming from is actually highly reasonable and surprisingly like fair to your friend who is like a bombshell right. and or but yeah. you know not not a kid and yeah. but is yeah well and, and that was kind of inspired by me wanting to you know she she, she found herself in a adopting a very pessimistic attitude about right. her romantic prospects and i was like no 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 <laughs> Here, here's another way to view it. Um, and don't worry, it, it's not about, it's not about your looks. It's about something else. And don't, and don't worry, you're, you're, you're quite, you're quite charming and, and that's not the problem. But I, regardless of that article, I think you're always, if you're trying to put something out there that's, that's, uh, you know, that's going to get attention and get to get views, it's got to come from a different point of view than one we've already heard a lot of times. So I would sort of, start there. One, I wonder if I can do this real quickly, just as in terms of process. I, I so you know, you, you noted that I sometimes I, I write for a while, and then I seem to go away, and then I come back. Um, and partially, it's because I'm, I'm just overwhelmed with either advertising or working on this book I've been I've been on for now. But I have, I keep I don't know if the rest of you keep notes in your in your phone. But uh, just as a this is a notes folder of all of my upcoming article ideas. I'm just going to keep scrolling. This is about 60 article premises here. I don't know if you can even yeah, see it. Yeah, it looks like you have a lot of notes below the, like it's not just yeah. a, a subject or a title. So yeah, so so each one is is a is a you know is a is a is a title, yeah. <laughs> and then here's sort of my rough thoughts, and then I'll turn that into another. But I've got I, I counted them up recently, and I think it's 62. I've put out about five or Love six that. recently. So 
I also think like best way to get one or two great articles is start with about 20, just, just the premise. You don't have to write the whole thing. And if, if a week later that premise still seems, seems compelling to you, then maybe go back to it. Some of them, you know, you'll have a couple of whiskeys in the bar one night and be like, oh, this is a great idea. I'm gonna enter my phone and the next morning. Like, eh, it's a little generic. I've heard somebody argue this point before. So you, and so you I think, Mark, go ahead. you mentioned your book. I wanna get into that in a second. And I sure. want people to learn about that. In terms of being a writer in 2023, it's not just articles of, or titles, obviously. It's also like, how do you share it? Um, because mm -hmm. obviously we're kind of masters of that historically, but it's a new yeah. world where Facebook kind of kills links. Yeah. You know, um, Instagram doesn't even have links unless you count the link in bio, which is like most people are like get angry, honestly, when yeah. we share articles and they're like, what, we have to click something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of being a writer, I mean, you just wrote a book. How do you find a way to go forward, um, you know, writing on different platforms? How do you share it? Any yeah. of that stuff would be helpful. But, uh, it's funny. I mean, I, I think it's, it's an ever evolving uh, conundrum. And, you know, every year or two, I mean, it used to be, for example, back in the, the era of that, uh, that one article we started out talking about, your soulmate isn't who you think it is. You know, that got 1.5 million views pretty yeah. quickly because that was back in the day where Facebook didn't suppress anything. If, if people wanted to share it, it would just go wildfire. And it's a lot harder to get those numbers these days, especially on Facebook where so many people have left. And then you go over to Instagram and as you've mentioned, you know, and there's, there's, you know, there's a lot more eyeballs on there, but it's not as easy to share a link. You got to do a couple of extra steps and I've got to go to the, your main page and click the bio. Well, and more importantly, it, you know, is fine if it's hard for us to share a link, but for the yeah. reader, they yeah. inherently are it's structured to, to discourage people from leaving the app, which is the same as Facebook. So, yeah. you know, we'll get a couple thousand readers usually when we share yeah. a big, big article mm -hmm. at best. That's like at best. Right. And a couple thousand readers for a site like Elephant is like, yeah, that's like feeding an elephant a crumb and saying, you good? <laughs> Yeah, no, and I, I think, um, you know, I, I, um, I've, I've been a little late to the TikTok uh, movement. Um, and of course, we live under this threat of like, is it going to get taken away? Yeah. Are they going to, you know, with this involvement with China? But um, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's moving the phone. The phone has made uh, things a lot more intimate and a lot more visual. And I think things are going a lot more video oriented. So I, for about a year, I was, I was sort of teasing a lot of my articles with just a quote in a static uh, image and they were getting some interaction and now I've gone more of just a self hold video of me talking from the heart about what this article means to me. And I think that's a little more in line with this, this sort of modern practices. And I think people get a sense of your personality and it's a little more, yeah. it's a little more real and authentic. Yeah. So I think I would, I, I think we, we can all probably learn something from that. Uh, yeah. As other, other author friends of mine are all kind of uh, flocking to Substack and uh, citing the importance of building your own email list. Um, and so that you're sending out your articles, you know, each week in a Substack blast. Um, I, don't, I haven't done that yet. Does, does that mean I leave Elephant Journal? I don't want to leave my friends at Elephant Journal. I can't, I can't, I can't quit you guys. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's something we have to kind of constantly study. Um, and I think I put more, I put more effort into writing my pieces than promoting them. Yeah. Uh, and ironically, I work in advertising, but um, I come up with the, in the advertising world, I come up with the ideas. I don't, I don't spread them. That's the media department's job. They push them out there. It's my job just to bake a nice little cake and I hope you enjoy it. Well, so, I think that's why Elephant, you know, which mm -hmm. isn't exactly my question, which is how can writers survive yeah. and, and thrive and share in mm -hmm. 2023 with the changes in social media. But um, I think that's why Elephant has survived is you know, we still have like 13 million fans on social and yeah. we do the work. Like I pay a team of people to share your stuff up. Yeah. So you can, you know, the premise being like, okay, you write 10 articles, nine of them might be forgotten and small. Yeah. One of them is still going to hit and deliver. And we offer links. We don't yeah. spread links by Facebook. So if there's links to your book or whatever. So I always, and I, you know, Substack, I, I feel like writers are a little bit like, uh, a scared mob running <laughs> from like running this way TikTok, you know substack like elephant like facebook yeah. you know whatever yeah, yeah. Um, it's very scattered yeah substack the 
the promise of Substack is that you could build something over time, which is always mm -hmm. a positive. Yeah. The fear to me is, or the concern is they don't, they don't share. If you're on a medium and you don't have an audience and they don't share your stuff up, yeah. it's going to be hard to build it up. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, same thing I was going to mention media. I mean, a year ago, or yeah. two years ago, everyone was, everyone was saying, forget all these other yeah. third party sites, you got to go to medium. And then and now the same people were telling me to go to medium a year or two are like, it's all about Substack now. So I'm like, well, what's it going to be next year? Well, and, I feel, uh, yeah. feel like it's already next year. Like, honestly, a year or two ago, everyone was yelling Substack in my ear. And now yeah. I don't hear it anymore. I mean, there's that's the problem with these tech platforms is they're owned by the man, mm -hmm. they want quarterly results. Yeah. Like if Facebook was smart, they'd go right back to the good old days of like, let things go viral. Yeah, yeah. Even if you don't control the virality where it goes, mm -hmm. people are going to come back again and again to the town square if they know they can find good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this sort of, uh, they've kind of changed their paradigm and you have to pay to promote it now. Um, and whereas it used to just be, hey, we'll give you something really sticky that gets a million eyeballs, and then right. you'll run ads off to the side of that, and it'll, it should work out for everybody. But now they, 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 they squelch them. I have a few friends who kind of know the, the inner workings of, of, of how Facebook kind of controls what ends up in your feed yeah. and how the algorithms work. And, and, it's, and it's we a, do it's that like, too. We, we pay mm -hmm. mostly for like our sponsors, partners, but because mm -hmm. I have a little bit of a journalist like ethical yeah. issue with like paying to promote sure. articles yeah but anyway so let's talk about your book um sure. i'm a huge fan of and nessa you had a great comment earlier about like just appreciating you mark for your the tip about notes um yeah. and how you just write all that down taking the time to slow down when you have a good idea and, and mark it down yeah um, oh I, I irritate my friends constantly we'll be in the middle of a, a really lively conversation out in the bar i'm like hey hold on oh, I, I got a good thought here and it's just 12 more seconds and but that and on, cause honestly i've learned i've learned oh i'll remember this tomorrow i won't remember it tomorrow and you got to grab it really quickly and just beg forgiveness from your friends but if they want to be friends with a writer you, that's what you gotta gotta put up with our, our yeah minds I have like, a, Ooh, that's something i have a sweatshirt that says be careful or you'll end up in my novel <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, I yeah. earn your, your weekly elephant journal post. Yeah, well, it's true. I mean, it happens. Um, I definitely yeah. have that talk with anyone I date. Um, so, so, so my book, book. Want, want to hear about that? Yeah, is this your first, first book? I feel like you probably no, I, I wrote I wrote a romantic comedy, which actually started out as, as another book a while ago. I, 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 have a, I have a rite of passage romantic comedy titled Match Me If You Can about a 30 year old bachelor and his divorced 60 year old mother who agree to play each other's matchmakers for one crazy summer in order Wait, to I love this <laughs> in order to help kickstart each other's stalled romantic lives. So everyone loves the premise. Everyone's ever bought, I've had agents on board with the premise. Question is whether or not I've executed it correctly and all that. And I got, I don't know, I got to draft five or six or so. And then I got a little distracted. I'm a musician too. I was putting out a new album and trying to do my, and then I just kind of walked away from it. I know how to fix it now, but before I fixed that, then I, I started on this next book, which is a memoir. Uh, my father, uh, it's a father son memoir. So this um, is not fiction. This is your life. No, this, is, this is his life story. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's not an idea I, you know, sort of planned or set out to have. It's one that kind of stumbled to me. Some, I stumbled across and, uh, and I'll sort of tell you how my, my father passed away about five years ago. He had a, a bladder cancer and he beat it the first time, he beat it the second time, but it, when it came back the third, he, said, um, he, he said in the, in the bit I, I wrote that he told you about it Yeah, and survived another 15 yeah, years. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, um, you know, we, luckily we got a lot more time with my father than we might've had. And I, some people, you know, don't get much time at all. And I'm grateful that we, my father and I had an opportunity to really, we kind of drifted apart um, in my twenties and thirties and in, in my late thirties and forties, we kind of got it together again. And I was able to be there with him in the end, but my father and I always had this great connection with cars. And, and I had this really sort of heartbreaking moment where, you know, once he, he I was home with him visiting his, in his final week and he couldn't get out of bed anymore. And he had a, a, a to do list for me, sort of things to do in, in his final week. And one of them was to take his car out to get it washed and waxed one last time so, so that my, my stepmother could sell it if she wanted after he passed. And he, he took meticulous care of his cars and all that. And so 
I, uh, I'm, you know, my, my dad and I shared a love of music as well. Meanwhile, he, he couldn't get out of home, but he was, he was listening to John Denver at home. We got him an Alexa, like, so we could just go, Alexa, uh, please play John Denver Sunshine on my shoulders. And so I took the car out for, for a drive one last time. It was the longest, loneliest drive of my life. I just kicked on my, uh, my Alexa, of course, by saying that. Um, and so I, it was the lo loneliest drive because I knew my father would never be beside me again. And, and I went to sort of kind of attempt to commiserate with him and, and you know, pretend he was beside me by turning my phone on and uh, plugging in, you know, getting Spotify going and playing, uh, playing from John Denver. But of course, to connect a phone to a modern car, you've got to go through CD, cassette, satellite, nav, XM, Sirius, and all the little modes. And when it got to the CD, it stopped and it wouldn't move on and insisted on playing the CD in there. And what came on was the CD that I gave my dad of my latest album a year earlier. And I wasn't even aware he ever really cared about it. Or he, he, there he was listening to it in his, in his car every single day. And, you know, and, and my dad was, was kind of a guy who wasn't big on compliments or sort of verbal approval. But there I sort of had this incredible message that my, my music meant more to my dad than I ever knew. And so I had this incredibly, incredibly poignant and emotional moment, you know, I pulled on the side of the road and I was bawling and I was writing about it. Um, I was writing about it in my journal like a month or two later. And I just, and I said to myself, Christ, I got so many stories about my dad and I and cars, I could probably write a book about it. And then I went, wait a minute, should I write a book about it? Is that, and I was, I thought for a second, I was like, it's pretty niche. Like that's a, that's a narrow little father, son's cars. It's a little, but I was like, well, I'd read that book. If I saw that on the bookshelf going through the airport, that would stop me. I'd be like, give me that. And so I said, well, how many stories do I even have? Let me, let me see if I can get 100 pages. And I got to 200 pages real quick of the first wow. draft. And, what and was I your think, process of getting to 200 pages? Like, uh, you know, I started first by just me writing out like individual stories, like the time my dad told me about, uh, you know, the Eagles. Uh, the, the time my dad told me about the birds and the bees while driving it's the cars. Um, sort of like friends episodes, yeah. like little. You know, or just highlight like what's an individual story, you know, that I've been, and at first I, you know, my first swing at it, I had like 25 stories. I'm like, well, maybe I can get up to 30. That might be enough to fill a book. In the end, after three or four years of working on it, I remembered 159 stories of my father and I in cars, whether it was just a little joke or him dropping me off at, at at college or dropping me off at high school the first time and teaching me how you know talking to me about how to shave and so you didn't try to do it chronologically it was just stories stories story, no story. i did it, it took a while to figure out and then I, I was like well how many cars did he have and then i realized you know i was like good lord there's like 25 29 cars and then i thought what if each car is the beginning of a different chapter that would be a cool way to organize a book um and so i've done that the problem is some of the cars we had for 30 years and some we only had for two so I had to do this, it took me a while to structure it. I had to do this overlapping, like car number one enters the family in 1976, but it stays till 2001. So and, but meanwhile, in 1978, we get another car. So that starts right. another chapter. It was, it was a bit of a logistical uh, Jenga, you know, uh, puzzle. And it, it took a while to figure out how I wanted to structure it. Uh, but and in the end, it, it's, it's, actually, it's actually fairly, yeah, it's actually fairly chronological. And I'm working with an amazing editor now. Nicola Krauss, um, who is um, an incredible book doctor. If you remember the, uh, the book and then movie, The Nanny Diaries, she is one half of the writing team of The Nanny Diaries, uh, Nicola wow. Krauss, and is now, uh, she still writes books as well, but she's an amazingly insightful book editor. Uh, and she's been working with me for the last uh, year or two, uh, helping, me, helping me thin it down. Uh, it, was, I, I, it lost about 150 pages at one point. She's like, you don't, you don't need every story, Mark. You just need the ones that, move the narrative forward. And that was a big lesson as well. Like just because it happened doesn't mean it belongs in your book. What, what if it doesn't move the narrative forward, but it's incredibly meaningful to you? Either yeah. happy, sad, whatever. Yeah, no, that, that became a bit of a problem. Because, um, you know, I think she sort of said, you know, there was a couple of stories where, hey, you know, the overall thrust of, um, um, of, the, of the story is kind of two men who aren't really connecting. And, but they eventually get there. And so if, you know, I had a few happier scenes that kind of just interrupt the flow. It's sort of like if you have Superman trying to save the world and all of a sudden it looks like he's got the world saved halfway through and like, all right, I'm, I'm, I think we've seen the whole movie, I'm walking out. Uh, and you gotta, you gotta kind of make it look like the, the prize is still in jeopardy of, uh, 
of you know of the destinations so in jeopardy of not being reached the narrative thread yeah and it's just so there's always kind of a tension like will they all right there's progress but it's not quite perfect yet until you, know, you get to the end so I, I i learned to kind of and then some of them were just kind of great interesting stories that meant a lot to me but the reader was like yeah i, I that's kind of like that other story i don't see this isn't this isn't adding depth it's just another version of it was meaningful to me just because it's meaningful to you as the reader as you as the writer doesn't mean it'll be meaningful to the to the reader so it's i think so that's tricky important. though mark because you know when you were talking about titles you almost said the opposite and yeah. you know life is full of oppositional yeah. truths but you know that you said you're almost writing to yourself like if it is interesting or instructive to you then you there's some power there yeah well well, I think, how do I, how do I reconcile that? I think, um, well, hopefully, you know, what you're writing to your former self is, is the opposite of what the former self was thinking at the time. You know, you, you think your cheese is over here, but somebody's moved your cheese. It's in this part of the, the labyrinth now. Um, and hey, kid, I got to shake you out of your misunderstandings. So that you go, you go in a different direction. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I think you've got to, um, yeah, if we want to keep turning that we, we keep turning the page when we're unsure of what's going to happen, but, but we care about what will happen. And I think I had a few stories in there that, that she, the way she phrased it is you've let the air out of the balloon and, um, and, and it's the sort of, the story is no longer pulling us along. Uh, it's kind of lost its momentum and now it just feels like you're just kind of reciting glory days stories, but they don't really have, um, they don't advance the narrative flow and we can't see growth or, or, you know, or a frustration of the, of the, of the hero's journey. To, and do you feel to... like, you know, there's always, you know, talking about being a writer in 2023 with that theme, mm -hmm. the relationship with an editor is so vital. Yeah. Do you feel like, is there a discussion there or do you feel like just like, Oh, every time they're, they're right, they're experienced. No, no, I, you know, I, I push back on, on, her, on her more than she'd probably want. Uh, but I, I just say, well, why? I don't understand. Here's why that story is meaningful to me. Yeah. And, and she says, well, here's why it, it made me just fa start falling asleep. Uh -huh. And then I realized like, oh, I can take, I can still keep that story. I just have to remove that part of that right. six page story and I can solve that. So, that. you know, I, I think, you know, yeah, finding an editor you believe in is very tricky. Uh, by the way, props to Lisa, my current editor uh, at Elephant Journal. I, I, oh, I feel like I'm in very good. With her, um, so Aww. please please back that along. Okay, we'll do. Um, and uh, but I, you know, I, I think you, you're within your rights to kind of interview editors, or at least give them give them a sample. Like, hey, here's five pages in my book. What would what do you see? What would you change? And because you know, we're you're, it's like you know, finding a therapist in a way. It's 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 a very personal relationship. And they're, they're I love that analogy, Mark. Yeah, because it, it is this combination of like you do have to speak up and sort of disagree for them to know who you are and where you're coming yeah. from, but you also have to really trust their wisdom. Yeah. But ultimately you have to decide for yourself. You know, there, there's a Buddhist expression, you know, um, always trust the principal one and the principal one is you. You mm -hmm. have to ultimately listen to yeah. your own inner, yeah. you know, you know your own circumstances best. Yeah. And there's, and, 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 and then the other sort of the flip side of that is, don't hire a professional editor and pay them money if you're not going to take their advice at least once in a while. Because uh, I run into that in the advertising world all the time where I feel like I, you're, you come to me looking for ideas and big campaigns and a tagline yeah. or a script or a viral idea. You pay me money for them. I give them to you. I work really hard. And yeah. then you go, yeah, we don't like them. And I'm like, well, then why would you come to me? Yeah. I, you know, and so, um, I think you that's know. where the trust is. Because like, my editor, who is not famous or anything, she's... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, sort of my right hand uh, person on Elephant. Yeah, she loves my writing. She loves me. Yeah. I love her. But yeah. that doesn't mean that she isn't like, cut this, cut that highly critical. She cares immensely. And because she loves there's this trust in me, like she's looking out for me. And then I kind of relax. I'm in her hands. I'm on some level. I, I accept her yeah. wisdom and her cuts. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's definitely yeah, it's it's a relationship.